Hello and welcome to Russians with Attitude. Today we are going to talk about the Ukrainian counteroffensive in Kharkiv Oblast, which ended up as the first uh, major military setback of the special military operation and, well, basically the first major military defeat the Russian military suffered since 1996. So, for good reason, it has left people in a state of shock, disbelief, disappointment, if they are on the pro-Russian side, or in, uh, if uh, you are pro-Ukrainian, you probably believe that this was the greatest uh, military operation in, the, in all of human history. But we're gonna take a closer look at what actually happened, how it happened, and why it happened. So, first of all, what happened? The Ukrainian military launched a large offensive with forces amounting to around five mechanized brigades in against Russian positions in Kharkiv Oblast. Over a front line, the front line was around 270 kilometers and included some major logistical hubs, namely uh, Kupiansk and Izum and the town of Bovoklea, which expanded the road network and protected the flank of uh, the logistics in the area. All of these towns uh, were abandoned and the Russian military retreated to the Askol River and now only controls a small part of Kharkiv Oblast, around 100 kilometers in length and uh, 30 kilometers in width. So, what actually happened? The Ukrainians took over an area that is around the size of the US state of Rhode Island and uh, disrupted the Russian logistics network in Kharkiv Oblast, which made it untenable to further keep a military presence there. The Russian front in Kharkiv Oblast was severely undermanned and had basically no presence of the regular Russian military there. The few checkpoints, villages and towns that even had a Russian military presence were held either by conscripts from the Lugansk People's Militia or uh, paramilitary National Guard units, including uh, police units like uh, Sober, which is uh, close to what a SWAT team is in the USA. Of course, it is more militarized and uh, Sober units have been used in military operations ever since uh, the Chechen Wars, uh, since, uh, as it turned out, anti-crime and anti-terror operations in urban areas uh, have transferable skills that are also useful in urban combat. But still, these are paramilitary units with little uh, in terms of heavy weapons, uh, little to no artillery support, and uh, almost no tanks or anything like this. So these uh, few units, I would guess that they numbered around between one and 2,000 over this whole uh, front line, while the Ukrainian uh, offensive included uh, was very large. There have been different assessments if it was a full five brigades or only parts, but in any case, at least uh, 10 to 20,000 uh, Ukrainian soldiers were involved in this operation, including also irregular uh, units like the neo Nazi Kraken battalion and also a lot of foreign uh, mercenaries, I would guess that from the available video and from what soldiers on the front lines and people in the newly uh, occupied uh, towns are saying, there is a very large foreign presence. Uh, just yesterday people were talking about how Volchansk is now uh, full of uh, like English-speaking black people and uh, yeah. The degree to which this uh, offensive can be called uh, really a Ukrainian or a NATO offensive is, uh, of course, uh, debatable, but it doesn't really matter since it's it's one of those things that Z supporters like to use a scope, uh, like, oh, it was NATO, not Ukraine, but yeah, no shit, we're at war with NATO, what the fuck did you expect? Like, the, there is uh, no reason to expect that uh, NATO would not be major involved in a major way. The Ukrainian military is under NATO control. 
um, they approve or disapprove of Ukrainian missile strikes and uh, the Ukrainian generals directly say so. There is absolutely nothing surprising about a large influx of uh, both uh, so-called volunteers and PMCs uh, or regular uh, foreign unit, military units that act under the cover of PMCs. I had uh, two friends who uh, are, were on the front lines in the south. They were in different parts of the front, uh, hundreds of kilometers apart, and both personally listened to Polish uh, radio. There is a large presence um, of foreigners, and it's uh, no excuse for military failure, because this was to be expected. Uh, so, yeah. I'm not going to use that as an argument for why the Ukrainian operation was successful. The Ukrainian operation was successful because the Russian military simply didn't put enough soldiers in that area. That's it. There was no really mm, defeat in the sense that Russian troops were not routed. There were no major losses on the Russian side. They retreated uh, for the most part in good order and so on and so on. So this is a small mercy, I guess, um, but the problem is not that Russian army units uh, were encircled and destroyed. This did not happen, uh, thankfully, but the whole situation occurred because there were too few Russian forces in the area and not putting them there, not allocating the manpower in a proper way is already the defeat. So, the, of course, as soon as the Ukrainian army cut off um, the highway, the N26 highway, the M03 highway, the R78 highway, which are the crucible for all Russian logistics in the area, it became, it made no sense to stay in the area. And from that point of view, the retreat was, uh, from a military point of view, the retreat was absolutely the correct decision. And it was the only play and it was executed fairly well. But the only thing that necessitated even doing this uh, was already a major failure. So there have been some Ukrainian advances in this area um, even before, uh, specifically south of Izum, in, uh, where in the area of Brazhivka, Surigovka, and so on, uh, Vilike Kamushovacha, Dolginke also, because the area has a lot of hills, a lot of forests, and uh, the terrain is uh, very difficult for the Russian forces to hold, especially with such limited manpower. So it is possible, there is a theory that it has already been decided uh, quite a long time ago to abandon large parts of Kharkov Oborsk, um, and uh, that this is why they put so few troops there. But the only reason why it's difficult to whole circle for boost just because they initially put too few troops in there so uh, it's kind of a circular logic here so i don't know uh, if uh, it's really a good explanation of what happened there so the situation was that you had company or even platoon sized elements of uh, Rosgvardia, Russian National Guard and uh, Lugansk reservists uh, protecting against the full force of several Ukrainian mechanized brigades. This uh, of course could only end in retreat. It is uh, to the glory of the defenders that they were really good at holding the line and it's actually surprising that Boaklea held on for so long for as long as it did since it was defeated by Sobr, so police units with no heavy weapons against tanks but it was in the end pointless except to cover the retreat which is of course a very important job and to especially cover evacuees. Yeah, that's another very painful topic that we're going to talk about a bit later. All in all, this operation is uh, reminds one, of course, of the Kharkiv catastrophe of spring 1942. The second battle for Kharkiv, um, the Operation Fridericus II, when having failed to take Kharkiv in the spring offensive from the north of Saltov in March and uh, trying to bypass it from the southeast through Izum and Boroklea in May. The troops of uh, Marshal Timoshenko were surrounded after a simultaneous strike by the Germans from Kupiansk, uh, on, on, on Kupiansk from the west and on Izum to the south. And the whole difference is, of course, that in the triangle of uh, Mirefa was a in Boroklea in May and June of 1942, several armies were encircled and uh, the whole front collapsed. The Soviet army lost a quarter million soldiers, 
and a hole of several hundred kilometers appeared, after which the Wehrmacht uh, within a few weeks reached Voronezh and then in summer blew through Donbass and uh, reached the Volga north of Stalingrad. The defect in strategic planning was the same both then and now. In both cases we were advancing south and southwest along the Askol River and simply left behind uh, such a powerful and convenient logistical center for a counter-attack as heck. So yeah, history rhymes, as uh, we like to say, and uh, I, think it was, I think it was a Mark Twain quote or something, I don't remember, but um, that war is God's way of teaching us geography. And in this case, the Russian generals obviously did not learn their lesson. So why did they put so few troops there? This is a question that is very difficult to answer as I don't have any special insight into what the uh, Russian generals uh, responsible for Army Group West were thinking. There have been complaints about the leadership of Army Group West for months now, since at least May. What I suppose happened is that uh, the general level of competence in Army Group West is low for some reason, much lower than uh, Center or South, which are successfully holding the line or advancing. And uh, West, the leaders of Army Group West likely um, are just, uh, excuse my language, fucking retards and uh, lazy and incompetent and stupid. And uh, those faked reports and wrote reports back to um, high command that everything is fine, that uh, units that are in real life at like uh, 15% are on paper at 100%, and uh, there are no battalions with just 20 people in them, and uh, everything is great, and uh, Donbass reservists have everything they need, and so on and so on. Uh, because otherwise would implicate that they first that they maybe did something wrong and that they have to do some work that they have to organize these troops into a coherent fighting force but uh, this is uh, of course uh, can be avoided if you simply lie this is in general a problem that some people have noted that um, the information that high command gets does not correspond to reality in the field uh, as I said, especially in Army Group West, uh, this has been a major complaint for a long time now, and uh, now the Russian High Command is uh, seeing the fruits of ignoring this problem, namely losing all of Reykjav Oblast. On the northeastern side of Reykjav Oblast, uh, the Russian army retreated to the border and uh, left behind even the town of Volchansk. I don't really understand why they left even this area and didn't keep at least like a 30 kilometer buffer zone. Um, there should have been, in my opinion, no problem uh, in keeping the contact line at the Seversky Donetsk and Vovcha river in that area, but yeah that's what it looks like now and now we of course come to the most um, unpleasant part namely what happens to people who live there the russian retreat is uh, regarded as especially shameful because in towns like volchansk uh, kupiansk and boaklea and Izium, they were already uh, being integrated into russia the people were lining up to get russian passports the teachers of Kupiansk uh, went to Russia and received special training so they could teach according to Russian standards in the new school year which started two weeks ago and so on and so on. Volchansk has always been uh, closer to Belgorod than to Kharkov. Uh, it's both physically closer and uh, just in terms of uh, transport and e economically uh, Volchansk is basically a suburb of Belgorod but it also has been abandoned. And now the Ukrainians are already doing what they call filtration and looking for saboteurs and collaborators. And uh, as we know, uh, officially, according to Ukrainian law, it is already collaboration with the enemy if you receive humanitarian aid. So receiving water from Russian soldiers is already a crime in the Ukrainian state. So that basically means that everyone who lives there is guilty 
of the crime of collaboration. And um, of course, they are not going to uh, prosecute everyone, but only those uh, with um, pro-Russian positions who somehow worked in any capacity that uh, supported uh, the Russian occupation, as they say. And um, yeah, SPU is already acting. They have already uh, arrested people who served in the local police in Kupiansk, in Burkle. There are several telegram channels dedicated to doxing people who um, are reported to be collaborators, which in this case can mean something as simple as uh, not being like having a feud with your neighbor or something. Uh, this is uh, obviously a major part of what a civil war is. A civil war is when you make up political reasons uh, why murdering your neighbor is okay. And this is what's happening in these towns now. I've looked through these channels where they dox collaborators and um, they are the pettiest reasons. There are like uh, 80 year old grandmothers being doxed for receiving humanitarian aid. School girls, teenage school girls being doxed for saying that the Russians are not hurting anyone. People are being doxed because they worked as teachers or doctors or uh, in the town's administration or were involved in the organization of humanitarian aid supplies. So yeah, it's gonna get really ugly. And this is by, uh, rightly so viewed by many people as a sort of betrayal. Because Russia came in there, Russia said that Russia is here forever. The people trusted Russia and now they are going to get tortured and murdered if they didn't manage to evacuate. Thankfully, a lot of people uh, did evacuate. Thousands of people have crossed the border into Russia. Thousands of people are still being processed at the border. And even in those doxing telegram channels, um, Many or most of the latest posts in the last two days mentioned that the supposed collaborators have evacuated. So I hope that not too many people will suffer at the hands of the, well, what can I say, of the criminal forces of the Kiev regime. I can't put it any other way. Uh, they are sending in uh, foreigners and uh, political radicals for these operations. They are giddy with glee at the chance to uh, kill some pro-Russians. And uh, yeah, it's all in all a very ugly situation that has led to uh, the state of affairs. The Ukrainians have also attacked refugee convoys that were being escorted by Russian troops. Mm, it's uh, a yeah, very tragic and uh, very heinous thing to do. And just now they have fired at the border checkpoint in Vogachovka in Beograd Oblast, where a lot of uh, refugees are currently awaiting processing. And they have already killed uh, one Ukrainian citizen. Three were wounded uh, just at this shelling of a border checkpoint full of refugees. Yeah, I... Really don't know what to say about this, except that it's of course a huge tragedy for the people in there who trusted that they were finally rid of the Kiev regime. And it once again shows the true nature of what it is. But I think that's not even the main lesson here, especially for you listeners, dear listeners. Um, the main takeaway here is not that the forces of the Kiev regime are murderous terrorists. Everyone already knows that. It's just that some people think that that's really cool. And the lesson is also not that Russia is bad for leaving them behind. Um, war is war. It was inevitable. An evacuation was uh, tried to do. It's just one of those things that is very ugly. And it's uh, generally why people try to avoid having wars. But the main takeaway here for um, our Western listeners, or um, not Western, but uh, non-Eastern European listeners, is that uh, this is what people do in civil wars. They denounce their neighbors, they try to get their neighbors killed, sometimes they just straight up kill their neighbors, they fire artillery at refugee convoys, and this could be in your country and in your town too, because um, when things start breaking down, this is uh, what people are like. Right, so 
after this all happened, after Russia pulled out of Kharkiv Oblast, last night there were strikes against uh, critical infrastructure objects in Ukraine. And several major Ukrainian cities were left without electricity, uh, including Kharkiv. There were some crazy videos of uh, trolley buses in Poltava catching on fire just right in the middle of the street because um, the energy system was overloaded. The explosion of the thermal power plant in Kharkiv uh, was immense. It looked like I don't know, like a nuke. This is the first time that the Ukrainian energy network has been attacked directly. Normally, this is the first thing you would do in a war. It's uh, what, uh, for example, the United States have done in Serbia and Iraq on uh, day one. They took out uh, electricity and water for the people. But uh, Russia acted differently for, well, uh, a bunch of reasons. The first one being that uh, it's uh, trying as hard as it can to appear as a peacekeeping force that is not fighting a war, but like a humanitarian intervention, which in theory is not wrong, but it's not fighting some um, ISIS guys who are running around with rusty AKs in sandals. So it has to be fought like a real war to achieve success. The second reason is that... Um, the Russian military has avoided collateral damage to civilians as much as possible. And even though the other side is uh, lying about this and, uh, you know, their latest uh, talking point that more people died in Mariupol, more civilians died in Mariupol than were killed by the nukes in Hiroshima and Nagasaki and stuff like this, they just make up wild shit. Cases uh, that the Russian military has avoided uh, collateral damage to the point of it being major, major hindrance to military success. So protecting local civilians uh, at the expense of um, the military is a uh, big liability. It's uh, a normal and good thing to do if you're fighting a civilized enemy with whom gentlemen's agreements are possible. But the Russian military is fighting what amounts to ISIS with 20 million people under their command and the full military infrastructure of NATO. So it's not really a possibility. It has not been a possibility for a very long time, but the Russian high command refuses to uh, leave this. For example, even in Mariupol, which was a very big, a very big urban operation that was uh, over surprisingly quickly uh, compared to other big urban battles in the last decades. Even there, half the time, the Russian military was busy just evacuating civilians instead of uh, storming buildings or whatever. So in the first days of the war, it was actually absurd. The rules of engagement were such that it's hard to describe just how absurd it was. Russian soldiers had an order not to open fire at Ukrainian soldiers if it could be avoided. The Russian missile strikes did not attack military targets where a lot of Ukrainian soldiers were present because it was a clear and specific order to try to avoid killing Ukrainian soldiers. This, um, well, delusional stance uh, didn't last for very long, but the stance that collateral damage has to be avoided at all costs at the expense of military success is one that the Russian military has been pursuing now for half a year. The strikes against critical uh, infrastructure and electricity infrastructure of last night could be a signal that this is slowly uh, changing and Russia is going to prosecute this war as a real war, regardless of whether they change the legal status or not. And yeah, the fact that it took only four missiles, all of which hit the targets, to cause uh, blackouts in half of Ukraine clearly shows that Russia has the conventional military capability to make life unbearable for all of Ukraine. But it's a choice not to do it. And it looks like the Russian high command is slowly coming around to the position that this is not the correct choice. I mean, it's a question of degrees, of course, but making military logistics possible by striking dual purpose targets is uh, one of the things that should have been done on February 24th from a military perspective. 
Of course, this is a war. The Russian high command and government has been acting under the illusion that they can let this special military operation be guided by political principles and not by military principles, which works to a small degree, I guess. So far, this was uh, the first real major defeat. But if they don't change their stance more, defeats like this will come because it is incomprehensible that the subway in Kharkiv was working until yesterday. It is incomprehensible that the trains run on time in Ukraine. It is incomprehensible that the Ukrainian military has access to internet and electricity and water in the field. Of course, it will cause human suffering to attack the system. It will. There is uh, no way around this. There is no way to sugarcoat this. People will die because of this. Uh, hospitals will have no electricity. And um, people might be left without uh, water, without heat and especially before winter this can become critical but i think one of the main lessons of the special military operation so far is that if you take your time and bide your time and use the soft gloves approach against an enemy who is getting who has access to unlimited amounts of manpower and functionally unlimited amounts of weaponry because of the influx from the west then prolonging this conflict is bad for everyone involved and the best way to avoid unnecessary human suffering would be to cause some now to avoid causing a lot more later but it's not clear whether uh, Russia will really uh, change their stance on this whether this was a one-off action whether this was a fuck around and find out type thing just to remind the Ukrainians that Russia can do this and chooses not to. It might be a signal to the West for some diplomatic purpose. I don't know. We will see whether this is uh, now systemic or not by what happens in the coming weeks. But for now, uh, the Russian army will probably concentrate on liberating the rest of Donetsk Oblast and possibly expanding their position around Nikolaev. There is also uh, an expectation of a Ukrainian uh, counteroffensive in, in some other part of uh, Ukraine, possibly around Zaporozhye, possibly around Ugledar. Um, there have already been unsuccessful counterattacks uh, around Donetsk itself, but uh, for now I don't think that uh, much more will happen in Kharkiv Oblast uh, without an influx of fresh Russian troops which at this point is not a luxury but an absolute necessity to keep up with military operations. The approach of uh, engaging an enemy who has five times your numbers and is in well duck in defensive positions and has um, better intelligence because uh, like something like 70% of the world's intelligence potential is working for them at any given time. Um, it just doesn't work. It uh, has worked because of um, Russian superiority in conventional weapons. It has worked because the Russian infantry is at a much higher level than the Ukrainian infantry, but there is simply too little of it. There is way too little of it, and it's impossible to hold on to territories. If you have like 10 Donbass conscripts and 5 SWAT members on a front line of 20 kilometers or something, it just doesn't work. And if the Russian military doesn't change its approach here, uh, this will be repeated. And it, this will happen in other parts of Ukraine as well. But for now, there is uh, little to do but wait and see, I guess. RWA out. Until next time.